Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. This is probably a very big statement to make but I think this week I've got possibly the strangest murder case that I have ever covered. This is a case that makes absolutely no sense no matter what angle you look at it from. It's got so many red herrings, it's got strange sexual overtones, it's got suspects which should clearly be suspects but they just don't quite fit the bill. We're talking about Robert Eric Wan, who was 32 years old when he was murdered in Washington DC on August 2nd, 2006. So Robert Wan was born in New York City in 1974 as a fourth generation Chinese American. He had a pretty good privileged upbringing. He attended a private Catholic school in Brooklyn before going on to eventually attend the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. It's at the College of William and Mary that he meets Joseph Price, a name that you'll probably want to remember for later. The two are both active in the student government together and they would remain friends up until Robert's death. Robert was very much a high achiever throughout his entire life but alongside this he was also known to be a very kind person so much so that he was actually active in reviving the college's 13 club which is an organization whose members literally just went around the campus of the college doing random good deeds for people expecting nothing back and Robert was the main one who got this club back in action he was elected to the Omicron Delta Kappa Society the Mortarboard Society and the Golden Key Honor Society all throughout college. He graduated in 1996 and upon graduating he is awarded the Algernon Sidney Sullivan Award which was an award presented by the university every year to a student excelling in characteristics of the heart, mind and helpfulness to others. He was a genuinely kind person in every way which makes what happened to him even more heartbreaking. I know people get annoyed when in every video and every murder case the person's always described as like a lovely person, so kind, the nicest person you'll ever meet, always got a smile on their face, which I think is just a lot of the time something people say about someone who's disappeared or passed on. But in Robert's case, I cannot stress to you enough how true all of this is. So after graduating from the College of William and Mary, he goes on to attend the University of Pennsylvania Law School, where he basically wants to train to become a lawyer. Whilst at law school, he's very active in the Asian Pacific American Law Students Association, and he publishes a law review article about racial harassment in the workplace. So although Robert was a fourth generation Chinese American, he felt very connected to his Asian roots, and that is kind of what you'll see he focused on a lot in his life. He becomes editor of the school's journal on labour and employment law and he graduates in 1999 before going on to pass the New York State Bar and he clerks for a year with a federal judge in the Eastern District of Virginia. In the year 2000 he joins Covington and Burling Law in Washington DC where he focuses on employment law and commercial real estate and he's quite happy there for a couple of years and then in 2002 he goes on a conference where he meets the woman who would go on to become his wife, Catherine or known as Kathy to a lot of people. They meet at the conference in Philadelphia and they just really hit it off and they start a long distance relationship. Kathy lived in Chicago so every single weekend Robert would fly from Washington DC to Chicago just to spend time with her. Eventually they decide to stop the long distance thing and just get married and move in together. They're married in 2003 and the two moved to Oakton, Virginia which is just outside of Washington DC. They're very happily married and by 2006 Robert has moved on from Covington and Burling and he's now working at Radio Free Asia. He'd actually taken a bit of a pay cut to go and work at Radio Free Asia but Robert felt like he'd be helping more people by being there. His office at Radio Free Asia was set in sort of central Washington DC and it was a bit of a commute for him from Oakton to get there every day. It wasn't that bad, according to Google Maps, it's about a half an hour journey, but during rush hour traffic, that would be quite a lot longer. So it was doable, wasn't ideal, but he did it. So on August 2nd, 2006, Robert had his regular day at work. He had a legal seminar that he was going to attend that evening. Now Robert knew that it was gonna be a bit of a trek for him to have to finish at this legal seminar at 9 p.m. that night to drive all the way back to Oakton to only have to return back to Washington DC early the next morning to start work again. 
So he decides to see if he can sort of crash with a friend in the city for the night. At first he contacts a female friend who for whatever reason can't actually host him that night. So he turns to his good friend Joseph Price who he met at the College of William and Mary. And Joseph says that he's more than welcome to come and stay with him. Joseph lived at 1506 Swan Street in Washington DC and he lived in a row house or what we'd call in the UK terraced housing. Um, lots of houses all squished together, all sharing walls. But this was a very, very nice house. It would have cost Joseph over $1 million. Joseph Price owned the house with his partner, Victor Zaborski. And the two lived there with another called Dylan Ward and somebody else called Sarah Morgan as well. Just like Robert, Joseph also worked in law and he was very much involved in gay rights advocacy, serving as general counsel for Equality Virginia. And he litigated in a lot of high profile gay rights cases. Victor Zaborski was also pretty successful as well. He worked as the senior marketing manager for the Milk Processors Educating Program. He was basically one of the people responsible for the very famous Got Milk campaign, which I'm sure you've heard of. Dylan Ward worked for a software company. So Joseph, Victor and Dylan had a bit of an unusual dynamic. They referred to themselves as a thruple, a three-way couple. A lot of articles refer to them as being in a polyamorous relationship, which I guess technically they are, but I don't think they were looking for anybody else outside of the three of them. They were just in a very happy three-way relationship. For want of a better word, Joseph and Victor were the main couple here. They'd been together for over 10 years and Dylan Ward had joined them four to five years earlier. The three were all described by each other as a family. They had very much a family dynamic, but they were also pretty open about the fact that Dylan didn't quite have an equal part in the relationship. This was something they were working towards. They wanted all three of them to be equal. Um, but at the moment it was very much like Joseph and Victor and then Dylan was sort of like a little add-on, but he wasn't, they described him as part of the family, but it's always a bit of an awkward dynamic when it's three people. It's a little bit weird because Dylan and Joseph were actually the ones who shared a sexual relationship here. Dylan and Victor, as far as I can find out, never shared any sort of sexual relationship because Joseph and Dylan very much had a dominant submissive BDSM kind of relationship going. So their family dynamic was very much different from the norm. Joseph and Victor were the couple, Joseph and Dylan had a dominant submissive kind of relationship going, Victor and Dylan didn't have any kind of sexual relationship, but it was consensual on all sides, they all seemed pretty happy and it worked for them. Now as I mentioned a minute ago, there was actually a fourth person living in the house as well, Sarah Morgan. Sarah Morgan had nothing to do with their relationship, she was just kind of a tenant living in the house. Sarah lived in the separate basement underneath the house, which could either be accessed through the main door of the house or through a separate back door coming in from the courtyard. Sarah was particularly close with Victor, but she got on with all three of them. But to be honest, it's probably the only time you'll hear Sarah actually mention in this video because she wasn't in the house on the night in question. She had gone out for a night out with some friends and had told the men that she'd be staying out with the friends all night. So she wasn't to be expected home. So on August 2nd, 2006, Robert arrives at Swan Street. He got there at about 10.30 p.m. So his legal seminar finished at about nine-ish. He called his wife, Kathy, at 9.30 where he told her that he was gonna head round to the men's house soon and told her that he loved her. But first he was just gonna pop into the office and say hi to the night staff. So we can be pretty sure that Robert did most likely arrive at the house around 10.30. It works with the timeline. He's greeted at the front door by Joseph and they walk into the kitchen where they just have a glass of water, have a bit of a chit chat. Dylan joins in as well. And both Dylan and Joseph said there wasn't really anything interesting being talked about, just like small talk. So what I'm about to tell you first follows the very basic timeline of the evening and then I'm gonna follow up afterwards delving into some of the deeper details here. So Joseph said he went upstairs to bed at around 11 p.m. The house was technically four stories. They had Sarah's basement underneath the house. They had the first floor entryway. I suppose in the UK we'd call that the ground floor. And then there's the second floor and the third floor on top, which is where Joseph and Victor's shared bedroom was. On the second floor, there was the guest room slash office that overlooked the front of the house or looking over Swan Street. And at the back of the house was Dylan's room, which overlooked the courtyard. Dylan said that he went up to bed around the same time, all three of them sort of headed up the stairs. And Dylan said that he actually took a sleeping pill as he often did before he went to bed. And then he goes into his room. According to Joseph, he was falling asleep on the third floor when he suddenly awakened by an alarm system that set off. Now the house had an alarm system that would go off whenever the front or the back door was opened. 
And Joseph didn't do anything, he didn't go up and turn it off because he just assumed that it was Sarah coming in the house even though she had told him that she'd be staying out that night. He then said that minutes later, maybe about 10 minutes later, he hears the sound of a deep guttural moaning. Now he doesn't hear a scream, it's more of like a moaning and it's sort of two different significant noises. And so he goes downstairs with Victor to see what's going on. Um, as he comes down the stairs, he sees that the door to the guest room is slightly ajar and he sees Robert lying on top of the bed, apparently bleeding. Joseph said he walks in the room and sees Robert lying there with a the knife lying on top of him. So he picks up the knife and puts it on the side table and tries to stop the bleeding. When Victor realises what's going on, he lets out a scream and this apparently wakes Dylan up. At 11.49pm, Victor calls 911. I'm actually going to insert the audio of the full 911 call here. Um, it's slightly cringy to listen to because the 911 operator keeps referring to Victor as ma'am, thinking that he is a woman. Obviously, he's not. Um, it's quite long, but it's a very important part of this story. It gives you a lot of context. DC emergency 911 operator 6752. Do you need police, fire, or ambulance? What's wrong, ma'am? We just uh, we had someone that was in our house evidently, and they stabbed somebody. Okay, somebody's inside the house now. I don't know. We heard. Are they bleeding? You see someone yes, bleeding? Someone is bleeding in our house. Okay, where's they bleeding from? Uh, I think he was. I think in the stomach. In the stomach, is he cautious? Uh, Calm down for me. I'm going to send some help, okay? Female or male? It's a male. He's a friend of ours. He was, spent, he was spending the night with us. Okay. And who was the person that stabbed him? Do you know? Is he, is, is he cautious? We need an ambulance. Ma'am, this is somebody. He's not conscious. He's not conscious at all? No. We need someone right now. Is he breathing? Is listen, he, listen to me. Calm down. I'm going to help you, okay? Is he breathing? I'm upstairs. And he's downstairs. I don't know. Okay, who's downstairs with him? My partner is downstairs with him right now. He told me to go upstairs and call the police immediately. I just went to the stairs and... Okay, who's the person? Okay, I'm sending paramedics and the police. Okay, who's the person that stabbed him? I don't know. We think it's somebody with an intruder in the house. We heard the chime of the door. <sighs> And it's 15, ma'am, calm down, 1509 Swan Street, Northwest, am I correct? Yes, it is. The person that says, is she still in the home? I don't know. <laughs> oh, we got help in route, okay? Pardon me? We have help in route. Thank you. They're okay. here. They are laying route to you now. I'm sending the police and the paramedics, okay, to assist. Okay, what I need you to do is go downstairs, okay? The place where, wherever he was stabbed at, I need you to get a dry cloth, okay? And just apply pressure to that area. If he was, wherever he was stabbed at on his body, I need you to take a towel downstairs while you're waiting for the paramedics to arrive and just apply pressure. Even if the rag or towel is saturated with blood, just get another towel and put it on top, but never lift the, the first towel off the area. Hold it on. Once it gets filled up with blood, just put another towel on top of that and just apply pressure until the paramedics arrive. Yes. Yeah. 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 The heart. In the heart? Yes. In the center of his chest. Okay. Is he breathing? Is he breathing? We have help him right now, okay? You don't know who it was? No idea. Don't touch, don't touch this system. Okay, is he breathing? He's breathing, but he needs help now. Okay, we have help in route, ma'am, okay? We do have help in route. Okay, just go down there and try to tell your husband or your other um the other half to just try to keep him calm and talk to him, okay? Keep them calm and talk to them until someone gets there. Okay. And at the same time, get a dry cloth and just hold it right there in the area. My partner's holding the... Okay. It, it, holding it on him. Okay. And once it gets saturated with blood, can I get another one? Go get another towel okay. so you can apply it on top of that one once it gets filled up with blood. Okay. We, need, well, we need you to apply pressure on that area. He is applying pressure right now. Okay. Just hold it there until the paramedics get there. They should be pulling up any moment if they're already en route to your location. You don't know who did this. We have no idea who did this. Is the door open so they can get in? We don't know how they got in. Okay, well, I'm asking you now, 
if the door opens so the paramedics can get in once they get here. But, sorry. What were you saying? If the door opens so they can get in. If the okay. door opens so the, so the paramedics can get in the home. I'm going to go down. Is this a private home or apartment? It's, it's a home. It's a home. It's 1509 Swan Street, Northwest. The person had one of our, our knives. The person that stabbed him ran out the door with a knife? I, I think so. Uh, okay, anybody get any type of description of the person that came in the home? I have no idea. We have no description. We heard we heard the chime and and we heard the scream from our friends. Okay. And so we came running downstairs. We ran in. So you both was upstairs and your friend was downstairs. Yes. You heard the door open and then you heard the scream. We didn't I didn't hear the door open until after the scream and then we ran down the stairs and we heard we are we have an alarm. And so the chime went off. Okay. Is the ambulance, we really need the ambulance. Okay, they in route, they in route now, ma'am. Go to the door. They should be pulling up any moment, okay? I'm afraid to go down the stairs. Okay, the person who's downstairs was the person that was assaulted. No, we're in the, we're on the second floor. Okay, so somebody need to go to says open the door for the paramedics. You're not sure if that person's still in the home or not. I have no idea. Okay, we have paramedics in route, okay? What time is it? What time is it at the moment? Yes. 23.54. It's 11.54, ma'am. 11.54. Yes. I mean... I'll stay on the line with you. I will stay on the line until somebody gets here, okay? I won't hang up. We need them right now. I'm not hanging up, but we need, we need help now. Okay. They are en route, ma'am. They are en route. <sighs> Let me know when you hear the paramedics. Can you look out the window and see if you hear them coming? I'm, I'm looking out the window and I see nothing. I see nobody. Okay, it seems like forever, but they are en route, ma'am. They're coming. I'm here they are. Here they are. They're there. I'm going downstairs. Okay. I'll stand the line with you till you open the door for the paramedics, okay? <laughs> We have someone with stab on our second floor. <laughs> Ma'am. No, it's really an emergency. I mean he may be he's sorry. <laughs> Ma'am, it's gonna be okay. Paramedics arrive just five minutes later at 11.54 p.m. and they find Robert on his bed showing no signs of life and he's been stabbed three times. Just after midnight, Joseph phones Kathy and tells her that Robert's been stabbed and she needs to get down to hospital as fast as she can, which she does, picking up Robert's parents and brother on the way. Um, but he is sadly pronounced dead at 12.24 a.m. before his family arrive at the hospital. Now, he was most likely already dead at the house like he was very much showing no signs of life whatsoever whilst he was in the house in the guest room he was only declared formally dead at the hospital and of course this is where the investigation begins so joseph victor and dylan all speak to police initially without attorney they are interviewed until about dawn that morning and joseph price tells detectives that his theory is that an intruder came into the house has to be the only option here surely he tells detectives i know it sounds crazy in fact if you told me this and i wasn't in this place all night i would say no it cannot happen, that's crazy. But I'll be damned if it didn't. So initially they're all interviewed without lawyers present, they're just trying to help the police get a straight idea of what happened that night. Um, and then they're all let go by about dawn the next morning from what I can gather and they very quickly lawyer up at this point and rightly so whether you are guilty or not guilty in a case like this and somebody's been found murdered in your home you probably should get a lawyer. It doesn't mean that you're guilty, it just means that you're doing the smart thing. 
Of course, all three denied having any involvement whatsoever in Robert's death, and all three of them speculated that an intruder had broken in and an intruder had killed Robert. Um, all three also denied having any kind of sexual relationship with Robert, and he was described by everyone who knew him as straight and happily married. He was an LGBT ally, he had LGBT friends, but he was straight. The autopsy showed that Robert had three stab wounds in his torso, two in his chest and one in the abdomen. But the weirdest thing is that all three stab wounds are pretty much identical. They're all pretty much exactly the same depth, the same length. They were at the same diagonal. They were oriented at a 10 and four o'clock kind of axis, all three of them. Each wound was about four to five inches deep and they punctured some of his main organs. So according to the medical examiner, he would have been rendered unconscious almost immediately. But although he was unconscious, it would have taken him a while to actually die from these injuries with his organs slowly bleeding out. There are absolutely no signs of any kind of defensive wound or physical restraints used on Robert. The fact that each wound was identical and so clean shows that Robert made no effort to fight off the attacker whatsoever. If Robert was struggling, sort of like moving, maybe being restrained, then the wounds wouldn't have been as clean and as identical as they were. It's most likely that Robert was already unconscious by the time he got stabbed. There were also needle puncture marks found in his body, I think it was six in total, in the left side of the neck, the back of the left hand, front of the ankle, and in the lower chest region. And these were not from the medical intervention, they were not from the paramedics, anyone in the hospital. These were puncture wounds that were already on him. And according to his wife, he had no doctor's appointments in the week earlier that he could have got these from. He wasn't a drug addict, he wasn't doing drugs. So the only explanation is that they came from whoever attacked him. Samples of Robert's blood were submitted for toxicological analysis and the results all came back negative. Nothing was found in his bloodstream, at least nothing that they were actually testing for. However, toxicology tests aren't as easy as just sort of like putting the blood in a system and waiting for it to tell you every single thing that's in the blood. It's much more scientific than that. You need to know what you're looking for in order to find it. So all you can do is run specific tests based on the circumstances at the time. For example, if somebody dies in a car crash, you test for alcohol and drugs in their system. And Robert's death was so strange that they weren't really sure exactly what to look for at the time. They just ran the standard test testing. So although there are actually no substances found in the blood, it doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't anything in there, it just means they didn't test for that specific thing. And of course, the investigation didn't hold on to any blood after Robert's funeral, and so they couldn't retest it once they had a clearer idea of what may have happened that evening. He had sort of just a little bit of blood taken and that was it, and once they'd used it, it was gone. There was nothing more they could do. It seems very possible that Robert was injected with some kind of paralytic drug that rendered him unable to fight back. It didn't kill him, it just rendered him either completely unconscious or completely paralysed. If it's a more unusual paralytic drug, then it probably wouldn't flag up anything in regular testing. A lot of people actually suspect ketamine in this case, because apparently if it's injected directly into the bloodstream, it can render someone unconscious almost immediately. Right, so now I'm gonna talk about the more in-depth timeline, maybe dip into some theories. I'm gonna try and keep this as straight as I possibly can, but this case has got so much to it that I think I'm gonna be jumping around a little bit. So I really hope you can keep track. It's a very complex case, and I've sort of like been working on my script for this for ages, trying to figure out the best way to tell it. So please bear with me. So first we'll take a closer look at the 911 call that we heard earlier. Victor said on the call, as you probably heard, we had someone in our house evidently, and they stabbed someone. Um, the 911 operator asks if Robert is bleeding, to which Victor replies, yes. Um, the operator tells Victor to ensure that someone is putting pressure on the wounds, telling him to get a towel and apply pressure to the area that he was stabbed. Victor replies, saying his partner is already doing this. The call lasts for a few minutes until help eventually arrives, at which point it ends. The two paramedics arrive at the scene at 11.54pm and they arrive at the door and Victor's just kind of stood there. They ask him what's going on and he doesn't say anything. Maybe he's a little bit shell-shocked but the paramedics said he just sort of didn't direct them anywhere. So the paramedics head up the stairs and they see Dylan. So they say to Dylan as well, like, what's going on? Where do we need to go? 
And once again, Dylan kind of ignores them. He just walks into his room and shuts the door. So eventually, obviously, they find Robert in the guest room and they walk in there and they find Joseph sat on the end of the bed, not doing anything, just sat on the bed. The paramedics notice that all three men appear to be freshly showered. Victor and Dylan were both in white bathrobes and Joseph was just in his white underwear. So the paramedics find Robert lying on top of the bed. It was actually a pull-out sofa bed in their home office slash guest room. Um, so he's lying on top of the bed, on top of the bed covers. Um, he's wearing a grey William and Mary t-shirt, gym shorts and underwear, as well as a mouth guard in his mouth, which according to his wife would always be the last thing he'd put in before he went to bed. It was like part of his nighttime ritual. Considering he'd been stabbed three times, there was very, very little blood at the scene. The paramedic's first thought was that Robert had been showered, redressed and then placed back on the bed. The scene was just so strange. That was all they could figure out that had happened. It looked like his abdomen had been completely wiped clean of any blood. Um, one paramedic noticed that the hole in Robert's chest was big enough to fit your finger into, but there was still no blood whatsoever on the victim, on the floor, on the bed covers, nothing. Even his t-shirt had no blood on it. And the sight of Robert isn't the only thing weirding the paramedics out. The paramedics, having worked in the industry for over 10 years, knew that something was off the moment they walked into that house because usually you walk into a house where someone's dying and people are screaming, they're frantic, and they're desperate to help the paramedics get to where they need to be. But both Victor and Dylan have kind of ignored them as they walked in and Joseph has just sat on the bed, not doing anything to help. The paramedic said that it made the hair on the back of his neck stand up. Um, like I said, when they walked in, Joseph was sitting on the end of the bed and he was making no effort to apply pressure to the wounds like Victor had told the 911 operator he was doing. He was just sat there. And the paramedic was so unnerved by the fact that he was just sat there, he actually like visually checked his hands to make sure he didn't have a weapon in his hands. And then made the effort of walking like around Joseph to the other side of the room so he could keep an eye on Joseph whilst he was tending to Robert on the bed. Shortly after the paramedics arrived, the police also arrived and a police officer on the scene quickly questioned Joseph about what was going on. And apparently the story that Joseph told this police officer at the time is different from any story that any of the men have told since. Joseph apparently told this police officer that they found Robert lying outside the back door on the patio bleeding. And so so the three men bring him up to the room and put him on the bed. But again, I don't think this story is repeated anymore. I think that's the only time that anyone ever heard that story. The police found that there was absolutely no sign of disarray in the room or anywhere else in the house. Like I said, the bed was still made. There was one single indentation in the pillow where Robert's head would have been lying. Um, and there were two relatively small but well-defined spots of blood on the bed covers. That's it, just two spots of blood. The blood stains or lack thereof were entirely inconsistent with a violent stabbing. They also found a large white cotton towel on the floor near the bed in the guest room. Now like I've mentioned a couple of times, Victor told the 911 operator that Joseph was applying pressure to Robert's wounds with the towel and there was a towel in the room. And you'd assume that a towel used to do this would be covered in blood, absolutely soaking in blood. So you're probably shocked when I put the photo of the towel up on the screen now. There's barely any blood on there. Um, although the blood that is on there is confirmed to be Robert's. I mean, the amount of blood on there looks like somebody's nicked their finger whilst cutting and has used the towel to staunch the bleeding, not to stop the bleeding of three deep stab wounds. There was also a knife found in the room which police were originally told Joseph had removed from Robert's chest to the side table so he could like help him. Um, a later examination of this knife showed that there was blood on the entire length of the blade, five and a half inches, which was consistent with a stabbing. However, all of Robert's wounds were four to five inches deep not five and a half inches. Additionally, upon further examination, the knife showed a significant number of white cotton fibers on the blade, which matched the towel that was found on the floor of the room. Now, interestingly, the blood pattern on the towel was consistent with a pattern that one would expect to see if somebody was potentially holding the knife in one hand and using a towel to sort of clean it 
with the other. That was the pattern on the towel, not stopping in blood to stop a bleed. And even more interestingly, there were no fibres from Robert's t-shirt found on the knife at all, which you would expect to find. And so the medical examiner comes to a shocking conclusion, that the knife covered in blood found at the scene of the murder was not the murder weapon. The knife that was in the room came from a butcher's block downstairs in the kitchen and the actual murder weapon has never been found. Why would somebody go to the effort of placing this random red herring at the scene and it's not as easy just putting the knife in the room. Somebody's gone to the effort of covering it with Robert's blood using the towel. And just to remind you as well, by the time that Robert was actually stabbed, he would already have been either paralyzed or unconscious because all of the stab wounds are identical. There's no sign of him fighting back because they would have been a lot more, let's say, jagged. The medical examiner also collected samples from Robert using a standard sex kit protocol. He took swabs from the inside of the thighs, the external genitalia, two perianal, so sort of like outside anus, two rectal, and two swabs from the mouth and lip area. And semen was found on all of the swabs, apart from the swabs taken from his mouth. But the most shocking thing about this case is the semen found, even the semen found inside him in his rectum, was Robert's own semen. How does your own semen get inside of you? Everything in this case pointed to Robert being sexually assaulted. That's not a question. He was sexually assaulted before he died. But it was his own semen. So just to quickly summarise this weird case so far, Three identical stab wounds with no signs of a struggle or him being restrained, no signs of paralytic drugs in the system, although this doesn't technically mean that there weren't any, lots of needle puncture marks, and his own semen inside him. There is also evidence that Robert potentially could have been suffocated, maybe with a pillow over his face, um, due to the fact there were burst blood vessels in his eyes. This could potentially suggest the way that he was incapacitated, made unconscious, made paralysed, was that he was suffocated but he was still alive he was just unconscious and then he stabbed because we know at the time that he was stabbed he was still alive because there was so much bleeding but once he was incapacitated it's unlikely that he would have made any noise you would assume that the low guttural groans that joseph said he heard from robert's room were made when he was being stabbed but that doesn't make sense if he was already unconscious at this point but say if somebody was smothering him or injecting him with some kind of paralytic drug and that's when he made the noise by the time joseph got downstairs this person this random intruder couldn't have had time to stab him three times clean up the scene and then leave that just doesn't work as i mentioned earlier victor made the 911 call at 11 49 pm but even this part of the story isn't straightforward as the police started to interview the neighbors one next door neighbour who actually shared a wall with the house, there's very limited privacy there, said that they were watching the 11 o'clock news and they hear a single scream come from the house next door. And the neighbour is insistent that they heard this whilst they were watching the 11 o'clock news. And the 11 o'clock news ran from 11 to 11.30, so you've got a 30 minute time gap there to play with. Now the scream that they heard most likely wasn't Robert's scream. Robert probably wouldn't have had time to scream. The scream would have been Victor's when they discovered Robert's body. Now if Victor scream during the 11 o'clock news he didn't call 911 until 11 49 if it just screamed towards the end of the 11 o'clock news then that would have been closer to 11 30 meaning there was 19 minutes between the discovery of the body and them calling 911 but the likelihood is that he screamed earlier as well meaning that they had anywhere between 49 minutes and 19 minutes between discovering the body and calling 911 why on earth would it take them so long to call for help victor joseph and dylan all gave pretty much identical sort of recounts of the evening to the police when they were questioned so similar in fact that they either had to be telling the truth or they'd actually had time to discuss what they were gonna say beforehand. Now, as soon as the police arrived at the scene, they were sort of like taken off and questioned separately. They weren't really allowed to talk from that point. So if this is the case and they did discuss what they were gonna say, it would have been before 911 was called. Joseph Price said that when he entered Robert's room, he lifted Robert's shirt and saw a lot of blood on his stomach, which is strange because you'd think that a lot of blood on his stomach would seep through to his gray T-shirt 
and it didn't. The t-shirt had no blood on it. And bear in mind as well, the paramedics noticed there was no blood on the abdomen when they arrived. And although Joseph and Victor can act as alibis for each other because they were both in their shared bedroom, neither of them could 100% account for what Dylan was doing at this time. But Joseph did insist to the police that there's no way on the face of the earth that Ward could possibly even punch someone. I know Victor and Dylan better than I know my mum. There is no chance in the face of the earth that anybody did anything to Robert. Joseph also said during his initial police interview that the police might find his fingerprints on the knife because he picked up. Which is fine, I think, to say, because I would probably worry about the same thing. I mean, if he's rushing over to the body and he needs to, like, help, he would move the knife. Anybody would move the knife. And I know personally I would worry about my fingerprints being on it as well. But that isn't really the strange thing. The strange thing is that he also volunteered that the police will probably not find the killer's DNA or fingerprints on the knife because the real killer would have worn gloves. And he tells the police that, like, they don't already know that that could be the case. It just seems strange to volunteer that information. The house was searched thoroughly, top to bottom, and they did find drugs in the house in the form of ecstasy. Um, the police dog also alerted to prior presence of drugs as well in two different places in the house. Once in a cabinet in Dylan's bedroom and once in a dresser in Joseph and Victor's bedroom. But the only drugs they actually found was ecstasy. A cadaver dog was also brought in who indicated the presence of human blood or human remains in two separate places in the house. And the first location was in the lint trap of a dryer which was located on the second floor hallway just outside of Dylan's room. And the second was by a drain situated in the courtyard at the back of the house. Um, upon inspection, they actually found that the drain cover was slightly ajar, almost as if somebody had removed it and placed it quickly in a hurry. They also recover a number of very strange items from Dylan's bedroom, including racks, shackles, metal and leather collars, wrist restraints, ankle restraints, mouth gags, so on. The kind of stuff you'd expect to find in the room of somebody who's very into BDSM, as we've already discussed. They also recovered various books on inflicting pain on others for sexual gratification and manuals concerning sadomasochistic practices. Again, for somebody who was openly interested in BDSM, as I think Dylan Ward was, this isn't particularly weird. That's the kind of stuff that you maybe would expect to find, but when you look at it in the light of a murder investigation, then it comes a little bit dodgy to find books about how to inflict pain on people. The police came up with their prevailing theory based on this. They theorised that Dylan Ward had broken into Robert's room, incapacitated him and sexually assaulted him with the use of sex toys. This would be the only explanation as to how Robert's own semen ended up inside of him with the use of sex toys. And clearly it wasn't about self-gratification for Dylan, shall we say. He basically somehow caused Robert to ejaculate, maybe using some of the other toys found in his room. This is what the police theorised. Um, but everything points to Robert being a straight man. He was happily married to his wife. He'd never expressed any interest in men to his wife or to anybody else. He never showed any interest in a romantic or a sexual way. He was an ally to the LGBT community and obviously had LGBT friends, Joseph Price included, but he was straight. So you can assume that any sexual acts done on him were non-consensual. But the three men, Victor, Joseph and Dylan, have always remained insistent that their intruder theory is the correct one. And of course, there's always the chance that they're correct. Maybe it was an intruder, but it doesn't match with the timeline. According to the timeline, between Robert arriving at the residence around 10.30 p.m. and the 911 call at 11.49, there was just 79 minutes for all of this to take place. He would have entered at 10.30, had a chit chat with Joseph and Dylan in the kitchen, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, they then all go upstairs and they all take showers. Robert would have had to have get out of his clothes, have a shower, get ready for bed and put his mouth guard in. Which leaves not long before the neighbour would have most likely heard Victor scream upon finding Robert's body. That's less than about 20 minutes, shall we say, if we're being generous, for an intruder to break into the house, go upstairs, cause six puncture wounds, sexually stimulate Robert, stab him, and then the neighbour hears Victor scream. And then after that, it's another 20 or so minutes until the 911 call is actually made. And the intruder theory is made even more unlikely by the fact that the entire murder scene 
was cleaned. The guest room was scrubbed clean, the body was cleaned and redressed, the bed sheets were changed, and the real murder weapon was disposed of, and the dummy weapon was put in its place. Would an intruder really have time to accomplish all of this? It's possibly likely, but it is very, very much more unlikely than it is likely. Unless for some unknown reasons that the men have decided not to talk about, it was an intruder and then they decided to clean the scene up themselves. Why would they do that? There are some theories that this could have been a professional hit on Robert, that it was the government, that some of his law work may have pissed them off, it was some like just people high up. Um, but these are all purely conspiracy and I'm not going to spend much time talking about them, I'm not going to spend any time talking about them. Um, Robert was, at the end of the day, a normal guy with a normal job, with a normal wife. There's nothing he ever really did that could have pissed off anyone higher up. Um, that, in my mind, is the only way that an intruder could have done this, if it was a professional hit. But then again, why on earth would a professional sexually assault him? For me, the lack of blood here is the most telling part, along with the cadaver dogs finding blood in the drain outside and in the lint drawer of the dryer. It seems like, to me, potential evidence was cleaned outside all of the bloody water going down the drain, and then the clothes were placed in the dryer after getting wet with the hose outside. Um, there was actually nothing in the dryer when the police arrived though, there was nothing in there and no one heard the dryer being opened or closed at any point. Um, and of course there's nothing to suggest that the blood that was found in the drain and in the dryer was Robert's, but it's just very strange. There's also another piece of evidence in this case as well in the form of Robert's Blackberry that was found in the guest room alongside him. Um, the police found two unsent draft messages saved onto the phone one time stamped for 11.05 p.m. to his wife. The email indicated that he'd just taken a shower and was getting into bed, which kind of works with the timeline that I mentioned before. But for whatever reason, this email was never actually sent. It's likely that this was the point that Robert was interrupted by someone in his room. Even with this amount of very strange evidence in this case, there was a huge lack of progress and things moved very, very slowly with this because everything just seemed like a red herring. Like every single piece of evidence had been purposely placed there just to confuse the police. And it worked. No matter what angle you look at it from, it doesn't make sense. It continued moving very slowly until October of 2008, so two years later, when an obstruction of justice charge was actually filed against Dylan Ward. Then just one month later, Joseph Price and Victor Zaborski were charged with the same thing. All three men were later released pending the trial, but they were all subject to electronic monitoring and curfews. And then on December 19th, additional charges of conspiracy were given to all three men as well. Now I'll link the affidavit for Dylan Ward's arrest down below, it's a really really interesting read and outlines all of the reasons for his arrest, all of the evidence against him, which are pretty much covered in its entirety in this video. It states in the affidavit that the evidence demonstrates that Robert Wan was restrained, incapacitated, sexually assaulted and murdered inside 1509 Swan Street on the evening of August 2nd 2006. Moreover, there exists overwhelming evidence for in excess of probable cause that all three, Price, Zaborski and Ward, obstructed justice by altering, orchestrating the crime scene, planting evidence, delaying the reporting of the murder to the authorities and lying to the police about the true circumstance of the murder when interviewed by the authorities in the immediate aftermath of the homicide. Lawyers for all three men said that the affidavit was purely speculation, innuendo, assumptions and irrelevant inflammatory comments and all three men have maintained their innocence. I'm sure that the authorities expected, maybe even relied, on one of the men breaking at some point and changing their story, turning against the others, telling the truth, what the police think is the truth. And I'm sure maybe even the men may have been offered some kind of deal at some point, I don't know that, but just from my experience with these kind of videos, I'm sure that the police may have said to them, like, oh, if you say this, then we'll make sure you get a life sentence. Um, but not a single one of these men has cracked at any point and they have always maintained their story and it's always been pretty much the same. And that's important to remember, all three have remained very consistent with their story of that night. It's always been the same, they've never faltered in that at all. Usually when people are making up the story it changes over the years because they forget the details. 
if what they're saying is true, it tends to stay the same. The case went to court in June 2010 and the judge was Judge Lynn Leibovitz and she found all three men not guilty on charges of conspiracy, obstruction of justice and tampering with evidence. Um, the three men opted for a judge trial rather than a jury trial and at the end the judge explained her ruling. She said that she personally believed that all three men knew exactly who killed one but she wasn't convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that they committed the offences with which they were charged. Basically she thinks they know exactly what happened, she thinks they know who did it and they're just covering up but she couldn't charge them because the evidence just isn't there. Sure there's tons of evidence in this case but it's all over the place and none of it means anything. In November 2008 Kathy Wan actually filed a civil lawsuit against all three men based on the information that was in the affidavit. She alleged that the defendants failed to rescue Robert after he was injured. She also alleged the destruction of evidence and conspiracy to destroy evidence and obstruct the police investigation. So pretty much the same as the criminal lawsuit, just a civil one. And um, this suit was actually settled in August 2011 for an undisclosed sum and agreement. And I couldn't find much more information other than that. Um, so what do I think happened in this case? Let's bring it to a close. Um, honestly, I wouldn't be willing to place bets on anything here. I'm definitely more inclined to believe that it's one of the men in the house who did this. I think only one of them did it and the other two have been covering up for them. But I wouldn't feel comfortable placing bets on which one of the men it was. The only one I feel comfortable saying it probably wasn't is Victor and I can't tell you exactly why I think that. I just don't think he seems guilty at all. Dylan seems a bit dodgy and so does Joseph, especially with all the stuff he said in his police interview. Victor has kind of gone under the radar a little bit, but I definitely think he is guilty of covering up whatever did happen. If we're being honest, the intruder theory just doesn't hold any stock here really, does it? Like it just doesn't seem possible. Due to the sexual aspect here, I do see why the police were more inclined to believe that it was Dylan who murdered him and Joseph and Victor are the ones who covered up. I mean, Dylan had all of these sex toys in his room that he potentially could have used on Robert. Did Dylan potentially sneak into Robert's room for some kind of sexual gratification, sexual game, and then get scared once he realised what he'd done? I mean, it's technically sexual assault, rape, um, and so decided to kill him in that moment. Dylan actually may have been on some kind of drug because as far as I could find, Dylan, Joseph and Victor weren't actually tested for drugs when they were interviewed. I don't know what kind of drug would cause that kind of behaviour. Could it be ecstasy? They did find ecstasy in the house, but I'm not really educated enough on drugs to be able to answer that. Victor and Joseph hear some kind of kerfuffle going on down below them so they head down the stairs and see what's going on and they absolutely freak out and they go to the effort of covering up the crime scene. Potentially they leave things knowing that they're going to be red herrings and knowing they're going to confuse the police because Joseph, you've got to remember, was a lawyer as well and he would have known how this kind of stuff was going to pan out. But you've got to remember as well the original story that Joseph told the police officer when they attended the scene, that they found Robert outside the back door and took him up to the bed. Why would Joseph say this if this isn't true? Clearly they've already got their story together at this point because they've had time to do it. So why would he say that and then suddenly change it later? If this is true and Robert was found outside the back door, then yeah, maybe I'd be more inclined to believe the intruder theory, but I don't know why they would cover that up. I think they intentionally made the scene as confusing as possible to throw the investigation off and I think it worked very, very well. It does look like they're guilty, but they cannot be charged in this case beyond a reasonable doubt, and I can see why. None of it makes sense. But I also can't get over the fact that the actual murder weapon was never found. I mean, where would they have put it? The entire house was searched top to bottom, and it wasn't in the house unless they had a very, very good hiding spot, but then the cadaver dogs probably would have sniffed it out. They must have taken the murder weapon out of the house, and it's a wonder that nobody saw them. Again, maybe this does leave a little credence to the intruder theory. As far as I can find, the men are still together to this day, although no longer living in Washington DC. I saw that Dylan's now living down in Miami. Um, articles in recent years are pretty patchy. I can't tell you exactly what Joseph, Victor and Dylan are still doing today. I really hope this video made sense. I know it's a really confusing one. I know I was probably jumping back and forth quite a lot, but there's just so much information, so much evidence to talk about in this case. And I cannot wait to hear what all of you guys think. So please make sure you leave your comments down below and definitely go and give that affidavit a read it's very interesting thank you so much for watching make sure you give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel and i'll see you in the next one bye guys